There occurred violent earthquakes and floods, and in a single day and night of misfortune, all your warlike men in a body sank into the earth, and the island of Atlantis in like manner disappeared into the depths of the sea. Plato, writing circa 360 BCE. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you lads and ladies across the globe, and welcome back to our series on Bronze Age Greece. Last time we covered the rise of the Minoan civilization, a civilization that spread out across the Aegean to encompass culturally islands such as the Cyclades and also parts of the mainland, chiefly the Peloponnese and the Attic Peninsula where Athens sits today. And to answer a burning question you probably have after that intro, why did I quote Plato's Critias? And of course, how does Atlantis fit into the story of the Minoan civilization? Before you jump down my throat though, don't worry, I'm not about to spout off conspiracy theories, this is not that kind of channel, do not worry, put your tinfoil hats away, or even better, throw them in the bin. But the reason why I mentioned Atlantis in relation to the Minoans is that it has been theorised that the end of the Minoan civilization could have perhaps provided the inspiration for Plato's words on the mythical city of Atlantis. But before delving into that, let's recap. The Minoan civilization has spread out to culturally influence islands across the Aegean, including what is now known as the Greek mainland and also parts of the Anatolian coast, where the Hittite Empire would one day hold dominion. And the Minoans were not empire builders, instead their cultural influence just came to peacefully eclipse that of neighbouring civilizations such as the earlier mentioned Cyclades culture. The Minoans from this area held contact with other civilizations who held prominence in the Bronze Age, such as that of Egypt, Babylonia, and the various city-states on the Palestinian coast. But unfortunately for the Minoans, this dominance over trade in the Aegean and contact with other powers such as Egypt to the south would not last forever. In fact, the end of the Minoan civilization and its dominance over the Aegean comes rather suddenly, and it all begins with a volcanic eruption at Mount Thera, on what we call the Greek Isle of Santorini today. But this eruption is particularly important because the eruption of Mount Thera circa 1500 BCE is believed to have been one of the worst volcanic eruptions in human history. So powerful, in fact, was this volcanic eruption that it is believed to have altered the climate for several years after the event, bringing about such climactic disasters as severe rainstorms over Egypt during the reign of Pharaoh Armose I, the same pharaoh who expelled the Hyksos peoples from the Kingdom of Egypt. And at first, the fact that this volcanic eruption was said to have led to the eventual collapse of the Minoan civilization seems a bit strange at first glance. For the Minoans' main power base, their, I suppose, capital, even though they weren't a unified force, was on the Isle of Crete, roughly 200 miles to the south of Santorini. However, this eruption was so powerful that it was said to have triggered a colossal tsunami, one that was said to have devastated the coast of the Isle of Crete. And of course, what is there just sitting on a coast? Fleets upon fleets of trade and fishing vessels, of which by this point the Minoans had perhaps become dependent on in order to finance and run the palace settlements that they had built across the Isle of Crete. This tsunami is thought to have absolutely devastated the Minoan fleet, lessening their ability to trade with faraway powers and also to 
plunder the depths of the ocean for important resources such as fish, and with the added bonus of climactic disruption, it is possible that the food supply in Minoan Crete was disrupted by this event, leading to a pivotal moment of weakness in the Minoan civilization. And with a reduced food supply, as well as the inability to pay things that keep your civilization running, such as your troops, your defenders, the maintenance of your palace's defenses, and also your ability to project soft power across a wide region, the vultures will begin to circle. And one of these vultures would come to supplant the Minoan civilization. For after this eruption and the devastating blow it caused to the Minoans, their civilization gradually began to fade in power, dominance, and the projection of soft power by means of culture. And one people coming down from the Greek mainland took this opportunity very seriously and acted upon it with swiftness. These peoples were known as the Mycenaeans. So to trace the origins of the Mycenaean civilization, we have to rewind a little bit from 1500 BCE, going back roughly a century to circa 1600 BCE when the Mycenaeans were believed to have moved into mainland Greece from the north, perhaps from the Balkans, and of course into the Aegean area. And the Mycenaeans were believed to have been an Indo-European people, meaning that they therefore spoke an Indo-European language, which ultimately means that they spoke and wrote in a language that we are able to decipher today. And an interesting tidbit of information about the Mycenaean language is that it is believed to be the most ancient form of the Greek language, meaning that Mycenaean Greek could be perhaps the most ancient ancestor of modern Greek as we understand it today. And speaking of the modern era, let's move on to some of the archaeological sites that have been found and attributed to the Mycenaean civilization. For the first modern people to lay eyes on these sites, as they are, immediately linked the Mycenaean civilization to the mythical stories of the Trojan War, particularly to figures such as King Agamemnon himself. But why the link between Mycenae and Agamemnon of Greek myth? Well, that is because the name Mycenae, perhaps the most powerful of the Mycenaean sites, of course, where they get their namesake, is mentioned in Homer's The Iliad. No, this Homer. Not the one you're thinking about, this one. And in the Iliad, Homer writes of Agamemnon as the king of Mycenae and also Argos. And in the Iliad, Agamemnon has had several depictions throughout history, as a tyrant, as a ruler, and as a hot-headed general seeking territorial gain. And when some shaft graves at the site of Mycenae were excavated in the late 19th century by a Heinrich Schliemann, a golden funerary mask was excavated. A perhaps excited Schliemann immediately attributed this mask to the supposedly wealthy and powerful ruler Agamemnon of myth. Hence, this mask has been dubbed Agamemnon's Mask. And speaking of the warrior king that was Agamemnon, let's move on to the cultural divergence between the Minoans and the Mycenaeans. For where the Minoans simply peacefully eclipsed other cultures by projecting their own soft power, the Mycenaeans, by contrast, were said to be warlike. And with the Minoans weakened by the eruption and subsequent tsunami caused by Mount Thera, suddenly the Aegean, the Cyclades, and even Crete itself were ripe for the taking. For up until this point, the Minoans had in fact projected their soft power onto the Mycenaeans themselves. 
and perhaps fed up of being softly coerced into a cultural way of life, or perhaps out of rebellion, or the need to conquer a bit of the world, the Mycenaeans conquered, subjugated, and overthrew what was left of the Minoans, therefore coming to dominate the Aegean and part of the Eastern Mediterranean, particularly around the Greek mainland, the Aegean Islands, and Anatolia itself, bringing them into contact with several civilizations at the time, such as the Hittites, the Egyptians, and of course, the city-states of Mesopotamia. And this perhaps more violent and direct stranglehold over the Aegean would usher in a golden age of trade for this part of the Bronze Age world, with the Mycenaeans ascending to heights perhaps surpassing that of the Minoans who came before them. So join us next time as we meet the Mycenaeans at their absolute height, basking in the wealth and power they hold over the Aegean, the Greek mainland, and parts of Anatolia, and placing constructions that would one day puzzle those who would follow after them. So if you enjoyed this video, perhaps consider leaving a like and make sure you're subscribed, so that you don't miss out on further updates concerning the history of our world and its cultures as part of the Grand Portfolio. For now though, I'm Lewis of the Grand Portfolio, and thank you for watching.